So as a scientist, I found it quite difficult to prepare for TED. It seems so hard to stand here and talk in a lineup of people who have had amazing adventures like Anne. But my job as a university lecturer and as a scientist is, of course, in educating others, but it's also about measuring and quantifying things that help us better understand life on our planet. Now, in my area of scientific research, I study wildfires. And in particular, I study wildfires and how they interact with our planet. So typically, the first things that come into our mind when we think about fires tend to be about the danger and the destructive forces that fire represents. And this is a word cloud of people's responses. Um, I think I asked 32 people what was the first word that came into their mind, and this was their responses. But when we look at that word cloud closer, we can see that fire is part of nature and that fire is part of our environment. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about some of the positive things that fire does for our planet. In particular, I want to talk to you about the potentially vital role that fire plays in regulating the abundance of oxygen in our atmosphere. So I study wildfires within the remit of the area of science known as geology, which means I study the stories that Earth's rocks can tell us about wildfires. So this is our planet. It's four and a half billion years old. And wildfires have been part of this history for some 410 million years. And this long history is recorded in the rocks on the land beneath our feet and the rocks beneath the oceans. So when you see, next time you're walking along the beach, when you see a nice cliff face with built up of all these rock layers, we consider these rock layers like layers of time. And we can study those layers in time to think about changes in environment that have happened in Earth's past. And I've drawn a map of an area that you're all very familiar with here, the area of southwest of the UK. And I've mapped on three different rock types. I've mapped on some coals in the Bristol area. And these coals were formed in ancient swamplands. Now, these ancient swamp lands then dried out, and they were replaced by great expansive deserts in which red rocks were formed. But later on, these red rocks then flooded by a great ocean that deposited the very famous limestones of the Jurassic Coast in the UK. Now, we can track the abundance of those coals and those red rocks across the whole of the land's surface across the last 400 million years of Earth history. So if we look at this figure, I've got time on the bottom scale from 400 million years ago to the present day. And up the vertical axis, I've got the abundance of rocks. In that wiggly orange line, I've got the abundance of red rocks, and we can see those changing through time. And in the green line beneath it, I've got the abundance of coals. And we know that these two rock types represent almost totally different environments, from swamplands to deserts. So instantly, just tracking their changes, we can tell the Earth's environment has changed a lot. But in particular, the abundance of these two rock types can tell us about the levels of oxygen in our atmosphere. But how? Well, those red rocks are red because they contain iron. And this iron has reacted with oxygen in our atmosphere to form iron oxide. Now, you're all totally familiar with what iron oxide is. It's rust. And what we all know about rust is it has this characteristic orangey-red color. So next time you look at some cliffs on the southwest coast like that, the reason they're red is that they're full of rust. So if you think about it, when those rocks were forming millions upon millions of years ago, that iron in those rocks is effectively stealing oxygen out of the atmosphere, and it's kept it locked up in those rocks to this present day. So we can suggest, therefore, that times in Earth history when we form these red rocks, oxygen levels would be lower in our atmosphere. But what about coals? Well, coals are comprised entirely of plant material. They typically form in swamplands or in peatlands. Now, this equation that I've put across the top of my slide here is one of the most powerful life forces on our planet. It's an equation for photosynthesis. Now, during photosynthesis, plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they combine it with water and sunlight, and they use it to build carbohydrates, the building blocks of their structure. And as they do this, they release oxygen to the atmosphere. But then what happens is animals like us, we consume those plant materials, and as we do that, we breathe in oxygen from the atmosphere to create our own energy, and we release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. In other words, we've reversed photosynthesis, and this is great because this creates balance, it creates equilibrium on the planet. But if we think about those coals and what they represent, well, they're these huge thicknesses of organic plant material that's been preserved for millions of years, then it's never been consumed. So if that plant material's never been consumed, and animals never breathed in oxygen from the atmosphere, 
So this represents over very, very long time scales, huge kind of lack of consumption of organic plant material, but a quick leak of oxygen to the atmosphere. So when we look at those abundances again, we can suggest that times when we form lots of coals in Earth's history, we would have high levels of atmospheric oxygen, and times when we formed lots of red beds, we would have lower atmospheric oxygen. And research scientists have used the variations in the abundance of these two rock types to estimate the levels of atmospheric oxygen in Earth's past, which is shown in the bottom of this figure. And we can see that oxygen's been much higher in the past, and oxygen's also been much lower in the past. Now, our current day level of atmospheric oxygen is around 21%. And if we look at that point 300 million years ago when we formed lots of those coals, we can see that oxygen levels skyrocketed in our atmosphere. In fact, oxygen levels are around 10% higher than they are today. But this creates a problem. So typically today, if we leak a bit of oxygen, that rusting kicks back in and draws it back down out the atmosphere again. But if oxygen levels suddenly become very high, rusting simply can't cope. And so this means that 300 million years ago, we would predict that the Earth's system would spiral out of control. Oxygen should just keep rising and rising and rising to levels that would become toxic to all of life. But for some reason, this didn't happen. We see that it did stop. So this means that there must be another regulating force on our planet that somehow keeps oxygen within certain bounds. So one idea is that the re this regulating force could be fire. So fire has a very nice relationship with oxygen. You can see it here in this diagram. And you're all very familiar with it yourself. For instance, if you were going to start a fire, one thing you might do is you might take some bellows, and you might use those bellows to pump air and blow air to the bottom of your fire. You're adding oxygen to the bottom of your fire, causing your fire to leap into life. And so simply put, the more oxygen, the more fire, the less oxygen, the less fire. Now, if we were to increase the levels of oxygen in our atmosphere today, one result would be that we would expect to have more fires occurring on our planet, so there'd be more forest fires. And frequent fires tend to have one effect. They tend to suppress vegetation. So if you think of areas of our planet today where we have very, very frequent fires, such as the savanna grasslands of Africa, we don't tend to see any trees. This is because the fires occur too frequently, and the trees just simply can't grow back in between the fires. So this slide shows the relationship between oxygen, fire, and vegetation. Across this slide, I've drawn these two dashed lines. Where they cross is our current balance of oxygen, fire, and vegetation. Um, along the bottom scale, we've got increasing oxygen and therefore increasing fire. And on the vertical scale, we've got increasing vegetation biomass. So if we look at that, if we were to decrease the abundance of oxygen in our atmosphere and therefore decrease fire, we'd actually increase the amount of vegetation on our planet. But if we were to increase oxygen and therefore increase fire, we'd actually decrease the amount of vegetation on our planet. So if we think back to our coal swamps and what they were doing, well, they were leaking oxygen because effectively the plant material wasn't being consumed. But we could kind of turn this on its head and we could think, well, is there some way that we could stop the production of the plant material itself? And of course, this is where fire comes in. If oxygen levels rise, fire frequency increases, and then those fires suppress the vegetation in the first place, and it would have the effect of slowing the oxygen leak. So this plot shows the flammability of forest based on changes in atmospheric oxygen through Earth's history. And we can see that there's been times in the past when the probability of fires would be very high, and there's been times in Earth's past when the probability of forest fires would be very low. And during those times when we'd have very high fire activity, we would suppress our vegetation, and we'd slow that oxygen leak, bringing our oxygen levels back down. And where we'd have a decrease in fire, we'd enhance our vegetation, they'd leak more oxygen, and push our oxygen levels back up. So that all seems like a very nice theory, but is there any actual proof that fires have occurred through these huge tracts of time, these millions upon millions of years that we're talking about? So you're all very familiar with, obviously, bonfires, and the product that gets left after a bonfire is charcoal, masses and masses of charcoal. Now, charcoal is nearly 100% pure carbon. It's really hard to break down, and it's really hard to biodegrade. And in fact, charcoal can be preserved in rocks and sediments for hundreds upon millions of years. In fact, the oldest piece of fossil charcoal ever found is 410 million years old. 
So this means that we can count the pieces of charcoal in rocks, and we can use those as an estimate of fire frequency. And this red line that I've got wiggling through the center of my figure here is the abundance of fossil charcoals through time. I've then drawn these two vertical orange bands, and these are our two periods where we have very high oxygen in Earth's history, and therefore also high fire. And you can see in the abundance of charcoal that there are these peaks in charcoal abundance. In fact, charcoal, fossil charcoal is the highest that it's ever been in Earth's pasture in these two periods. So it seems that the fossils and the theories match pretty well. So it seems that fire's relationship to oxygen and fire's relationship to vegetation can help regulate the abundance of oxygen in our atmosphere. It can stop it going too high and it can stop it going too low. In other words, fire and its relationship to oxygen maintains balance on our planet and in part maintains the air that we breathe. So I just wanted to finish up by sort of thinking about some modern challenges that we face as the human race. So you'll have seen in the news over recent years, there seems to be these huge, very large wildfires occurring across the globe. And the occurrence of these fires seems to be increasing in their frequency, and they also seem to be increasing in their destructive power. But what I think I've shown you today is that fire is a very important part of our planet, at least over the long term. And this is a new word cloud that I've designed from words that I've said in my talk today. And I think what it highlights is, if we're going to work out ways to maintain our ecosystems, we need to learn how to manage them in a way that works naturally with fire, because this is going to be essential to maintaining the habitability of our planet in the long term. Thank you.